Okay, so uh, I have the uh, special honor to introduce our keynote speaker for the meeting, uh, Dan Hutchison, who is the uh, CEO of a consulting company known as VLSI Research. Uh, Dan's a very interesting guy. He's uh, been in the industry for over 30 years, uh, was a pioneer in the 80s in introducing the idea of um, um, cost of ownership modeling, which is now a uh, widespread uh, method used in the industry for making capital equipment decisions and technology decisions. Uh, Dan's Dan spends uh, most of his time uh, these days in VLSI research, advising companies in strategic and tactical marketing, business management, manufacturing trends. But to summarize, uh, he is um, in the business of helping companies, he's in the business of helping other companies make businesses out of technologies. And uh, he's really quite visionary. Uh, I got to know Dan. Uh, back in the days uh, in the uh, 90s when I was working on advanced lithography, uh, Dan has been a uh, great um, um, uh, visionary and uh, reporter and uh, uh, great insights into the development of advanced lithography, which of course remains one of the big challenges uh, to the industry in, in moving forward and scaling. So it's great to have uh, Dan here. I just want to put in a plug for uh, one of his latest innovations, Dan started a, a scientific um, a forum, let's see, it's, uh, he likes to call it the, um, let's see. I want to get this right, um, a virtual science forum, it's basically a social networking site for high tech uh, professionals in the technology industry. His, his website is called WeSearch. W-E-S-R-C-H, maybe it'll show up on one of the slides, uh, but I, I highly recommend this website. It's a, it's a terrific place to go to follow trends and technologies, but to also be there. It's a social networking web 2.0 kind of a site, specializing in uh, high-tech medical technology and green technology. There's a ton of really terrific information on there, and it's a place for you to put out there your information, a great, great place for sharing in the technology field. So. Uh, Wanted to put in a plug for that. And it's a great pleasure to have Dan here to tell us how to make money on low power technology. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to Dan on power, where and when and when not. Thank you, Jeff. It's, well, it's really fun to be here. I always like coming up to Berkeley. And uh, uh, so, and, and this is gonna be completely different from this morning, you know, cause I'm, I'm not gonna talk that much about transistors <laughs> other than, than where they matter in terms of the business and whatnot. So, um, by the way, the photos are mine, and, and I use them to kind of illustrate my work. So this guy is is determining who gets in the hot tub there and who doesn't get in the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and and power is a really interesting thing because I've actually been involved in trying to, to market around power now for probably the first time I did it was in the late 80s, so it's, it's been a while. But before I get into that, just sort of everybody sort of expects me to talk about the market itself. And uh, we do this, we have this semiconductor analytics service that comes out every week. And, and what we've seen is, is that the, uh, Mike, can you move up the mic a little bit? So okay. Little... That better? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, what we've seen is, is that, that last week we, we broke the October crash. You always see a fall off after September in the business. And things actually look pretty good. We're starting to get a positive lower channel, and we think we're through the big problems that we saw in the, in the second quarter. Now, the other thing is, is electronic sales activity looks very good. What we do is we look at what's going on in all the different websites around the world in electronics or people buy stuff. And uh, this is 2011. That's 2010. And, you know, this is 08 and 09. And you can see that it, it, it's forming it to look like a very typical holiday electronics season. So uh, it's not as bad as what you read about the world out there anyway. So now getting into this, I started off this power is the new fall fashion because to a great extent power has always mattered and it's always been really important. And you see that is if you look at Kumi's uh, law, right? But 
what's happening that's different today is, is that power really has new chasms to leap. You know, we've got issues with the server farms that consume too much power. We've got the whole mobility explosion, whether it's iPads or, or our smartphones, all those sorts of things. We're trying to cram a lot of computing power into a single device. And I don't know if you saw the, the news here earlier this year, but someone, uh, yeah, I think it was North Carolina State did an analysis of the computing power in an iPad, and one core was equal to like a Cray supercomputer from, from the early 90s. So it, it really is amazing. And then competitively, we've got Intel with its new 3D really uh, pushing the technology forward and pushing every other competitor in a, in a new direction. They have to rethink how they're going to make devices at 20 nanometers. And then finally, there's the whole cost of producing this stuff in the 10 to 20 nanometer range, because it's not cheap. So, but real quickly, let's get into Kumi's law. I don't know if you saw his paper, but, uh, uh, but basically what they showed was is that you got about a 50% or so compound on your growth rate in, in computations per kilowatt hour, going all the way back to ENIAC, coming all the way up here to modern day laptops. So, What's interesting about this is, is if you do the inverse, it says that the power per computation is declining at a 35% annual rate, which happens to be equivalent to Moore's law, which really got me kind of thinking about it. <clears throat> and, and there's a paradox here, and that is also, when we talk about power being in fashion today, is <clears throat> it's powers, it's, why has it taken six decades to us, for us to really see that we're becoming more power efficient? We just haven't really concentrated on it, but it's tended to come <clears throat> pretty naturally. And the other thing um, I, I, I think you have to ask, is this a law or an observation? And uh, um, it, it, if, if you look, you know, it, it's, I believe it's actually a restatement of Moore's Law and Denard scaling rules. And, and that, that's the fundamental reasons behind it. Now, going back to Moore's Law, what Moore said was, this is not my photo, by the way. I do wildlife, but not. Um, the, um, <laughs> the component density, um, basically it doubles due to geometry shrinks, same aerial cost. And the, the importance of Moore's law was not that, you know, he always says it's just an observation, but I consider it to be probably the first work ever done in innovation economics because he added this little thing, same aerial cost. That was really fundamental, and that's what's been driving our industry. But it wouldn't have been so great if all we got was more component density for the same aerial case. And then Denard came along and says, gee, you know what? When you shrink these transistors, you get proportional power and or performance gains, and you can trade them off for each other, which was, you know, really a cool thing. This, this occurred in 74. His original Morris paper was 65. And the, the result was what I call shrinkonomics. We went from um, 5 mils to uh, now today we're moving into 20 nanometers. And, and the benefit has been huge for the industry. This green line is transistor consumption, um, growing at, at uh, really amazingly huge rates. And, uh, um, and in fact, we say our industry is cyclical. The world c consumes transistors at, at a virtually constant rate. The cyclicality comes from variations in price due to capacity fluctuations and, and investment <laughs> fluctuations. But the world loves transistors. And, uh, um, and, and, and you can see, because why would you carry a Cray supercomputer in your, in your, in your, in your pocket, right? Um, so now we did worry a little bit about power back around 2000. And if you, you, I don't know if you remember this Intel chart, but the guy that gave it actually uh, got a lot of flack because he took this and had a nuclear power plant up here on his chart. And, and he was saying, gee, if we keep going the way we're going, it's, it's going to look really ugly. That, that, and 18 kilo, uh, nuclear power plants, about a gigawatt. So, so it, it was feasible to see that a microprocessor might get to a gigawatt. And, um, uh, and of course, this is another famous chart that's, that's out there that, that shows the era of bipolar versus CMOS. And um, um, this was a major leap forward, but back in 2000, we were really worried about getting to huge power densities in terms of watts per square centimeter. Now, there wasn't a nuclear meltdown, okay? Uh, no volcanic action or anything like that. We continue to move forward. We make more powerful processors today. So really, you kind of have to say, well, gee, why was that? Well, um, and when that didn't happen, actually, pretty much everybody forgot about power. And uh, um, 
We talk about it here and there, but if you look at even Kumi's paper, it focused on performance efficiency, not power. And uh, um, so if you ask, well, where did those performance level gains come from? They basically came from transistor architectures and processor architectures. It what, it's what we do with it because the systems are just assemblies of chips. They're just metal chips, power supplies, and, and, and a bunch of connectors. So if we look at that and, and we said, okay, what if we took the, this was my question, was take transistor counts and divide them into power efficiency. So I, I can figure out the transistors per system. And what I get is this chart is, is that Kumi's law drops to about 16% compounded growth rate when I, when I do computations per kilowatt hour per transistor equivalent. So this back here is the old ENIAC machine, which I'm using tubes and core memory is, is my counts. And then I, in this era, it, it was growing pretty fast. But once we got into the MOS PC era, we saw there was a huge, huge drop in these gains. Right, so that tells you that transistors have a lot to do with this ch change. And, and what you see is, is both, you saw both eras are really different. And what happened in the first era was we went from tubes to bipolar transistors and to bipolar ICs, then to NMOS, and then we eventually got to CMOS. In fact, it's really funny because people talk about life after CMOS as, as if CMOS was the only thing that existed. But uh, uh, for the older people like my dad, uh, bipolar was a big deal. And IBM, it was a big deal. <laughs> So, um, and what would we do with all that? We got huge leaps in power reduction, but we didn't use it. You know, we still had the same, you know, we were basically focusing on performance. It was all power. And uh, yeah, maybe we got in the lake to cool off on a hot summer day, but that was about, about it. So, if you take the 54% compounded growth rate of Kumi's law, and you have a 16% transistor normalized, and but you have 39% transistor growth. So basically, once you take away transistors and the impact they have on architecture, all you're getting is about a 16% power gain. So it's all happening with the transistor. Now, it is true that if we took all of the transistors that we know to be operational in the world today and multiply them times, assume that they were all on all the time, you don't even get a full nuclear power plant to, uh, to operate the transistor. So a lot of it is in the interconnection and getting from system to system is, is, is was discussed this morning. Um, so, but basically, the gains are coming from the, the transistor density. And, and that's what's accounting for most of the gains. So what does it mean for the market drivers? Well, you know, and, and is this going to change? Because CPUs are still the most profitable segment of the semiconductor industry. People talk about how great all these, you know, ARM processors and everything are, but the money's still made in CPUs. And uh, um, um, are we going to see that change? Well, one of the things, I don't know if you read the media but in the financial analysts, but they all talk about how tablets are going to end the world of PCs. Well, this is IC sales on a monthly moving average basis for tablets versus handsets versus PCs. And, what, and, and last year, when we look at the... The sum of the growth of all the tablet sales last year and IC sales were, were less than the growth of, of either PC IC sales or handset IC sales. So tablets are a long ways away from killing the PC. And, uh, and to some extent, that's because of how we use them. So let's switch to marketing. And how do you market power? Um, well, first of all, Marketing 101, power is not a market. Don't make this mistake. You can't sell power. It's an electrical parameter. And I'm going to show you why. It's, it's really, and it's a design constraint. And, and basically, if you look at power's first order design constraint, you start off with where you're getting your power from, and then that tells you how you're going to have to design your IC, what kind of function you need on, the, on this end of it, what's your power source, and then you've got to design that part to optimize around whatever your source is. And... And then the, the, the last order, really, design constraint is heat dissipation. And um, uh, we, we have all this, the, these problems. And you, know, you see these fans on this. This is actually my favorite. This is an Apple Power Mac G5. And you notice that it's got, like, there's a little radiator here. This, this whole cooling device was built by Delco. And uh, uh, it had a little pump, and, and the fan blew air by it. It was like a little automotive car. It was really cool. And uh, that was when they, they decided to get away from power and go to Intel because of the, of the power dissipation. So and then the other thing to think of is the box can be a whole building. This is the uh, uh, Google Dallas uh, uh, Oregon facility, 
And it basically sucks up. You, 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 they put them next to power plants because they use so much power. And uh, the other important thing to remember is nuclear power plants don't scale with Moore's law. You know, so as we need more of these, we, we run into problems. And, uh, uh, and, and a lot of times it's at this level. So the fundamental IC design constraints is if you're designing an IC, you're trying to get some kind of function per dollar, and you want, your, you want to minimize the energy in, maximize the function per dollar out, and you don't want your energy coming down here, right? Basic design 101, right? And, um, uh, and, and the, the, we're actually, where I get involved is, is over here when we talk about function per dollar, because this is just function per cost. You then have to create a product that people want to give you more dollars than it costs you to actually make the device. Now, that's really why processor power never uh, went nuclear, because everybody picks their, their markets, they figure out what the constraints are, they design to them, and, and they make money, right? And uh, it's also why, you know, you hear these battery life promises and people talk about the five-day laptop or whatnot, and, and all of those are kind of like a politician's uh, promise to reduce the deficit. It seems like every laptop only goes about two hours or so or three hours, and you get these big bricks and whatnot. <laughs> and there's a lot of marketing reasons for that. Um, you're actually a victim of my profession. Uh, that's supposed to be a joke, but... <laughs> Uh, anyway, basic business model. You've got a seller and a customer. The IC market's really different than this. We think, when we think marketing, we think this way. This is the way they teach it in school. And this is the consumer's view of power, that they're kind of addicted to this. And if you've ever been in an airport, you'll see people walking around looking for a power socket. And you, you notice when you came in here, everybody was looking for the power sockets along the wall to run their laptops, right? And, and you know you're addicted to this. And, and, uh, now, and so why doesn't it change? It doesn't change because... The fact are is, is that the basic IC business model, you've got the ODM over here, and they can be pretty dense when it comes to taking advantage of what the IC company does. And to give you an example, Steve Jobs wasn't at Apple at this time, but I, 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 knew, I had a friend that, that had a friend that had all these patents for lithium ion batteries, and I knew Apple, so I got him hooked up with the, the CTO at Apple, and the CTO at Apple <laughs> said, batteries are not a core technology for us. You know, and, and this to me was like, what? They were developing laptops. They were the Newton was would just come out and it was failing because it didn't have a good battery. And you know, I mean, Apple could have locked up that laptop business and it would have been completely different. But people tend to focus on doing more of the same, better, and cheaper. And cheaper always sells. And and because most of the industry comes out of Asia, they always think cheaper. And. Uh, um, and I say cheaper because it's it's not low cost. It's really cheaper. Um, and, and if you ever own an, app, an Apple versus a PC, you really see the difference. Um, now, when we get to mobile, it's even worse because you have the carrier now inserted in this, and the carrier is going to eat up a lot of the stuff here. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and they can be pretty wily. Um, now, here's the carrier's view of power. I'm a carrier. I give this away for free. No matter what you do with power in here, I have to, I'm going to give it away for free. So all I care about is how cheap you can make this. Now, this over here, I pay maybe a buck for this, and I charge $30 for it. So I give this away for free. I get paid $30 for that. For, if I include a little wallet, I get $50 for it, and that's instant cash. You know, it's, it's, it's just money in your pocket. So this is why, like, when you show up, at the carrier, and you say, I got this great phone. It can go for four days. They look at you and say, we don't want that. You know, but your customers want a longer battery. I don't care about what my customers want. I, look at how much money. We sell billions of dollars worth of this stuff every year, and it's pure profit. You know? It's, it's like drug money, you know? It's, it's that kind of profitability. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, here we are in the IC industry. We're just breaking our backs to make these things better. And, and they give it away for free. And by the way, an economist, the economist definition of value is what people are willing to pay for something. So technically, this has no value. That has a lot of value. <laughs> um, so anyway, the bottom line is, is there's a lot of sinkholes out there in the power landscape. And, and, and power tends to come pretty free with every generation, which is what Kumi's law shows, is, is, and, and Denard showed, was is that all you have to do is shrink, and you're going to get these power gains. 
and they come, although they're not doing it as well as we used to, as was shown this morning. And, uh, um, and you know, it's not more than a sinkhole. You actually step in a lava hole if you're not careful. Um, first of all, fabs are not free, um, and they're not even cheap. Um, and, and it's amazing because you talk about this free phone. The fab that starts off to go build this is today uh, a four to five billion dollar affair to invest in a production level fab. And then you've got to spend three to five billion dollars in doing all the process development. And it's amazing that anyone makes money when, when the end product sells for free. So, um, but we do, and the reason why we do is if you come back and, and you ask the question, uh, economists love boundaries. So, so if you ask the question of uh, why don't you just use a cheaper fab, why don't you go back to 130 nanometer or whatnot, and, and you look at the cost of these, what you find is, is the cost per pixel of lithography or the cost per transistor of these fabs has followed Moore's law. So, so I'm always getting, you know, I'm able to keep my cost, my aerial cost <laughs> contained. I get more transistors in that by shrinking, and that's what makes the economics work, makes these expensive fabs work. And it's why, I don't know if you know this, but the first lithography tool cost 10 cents. It was a camel's hair brush. They used a wax pot, and the operator painted the patterns on the, the transistors. And the biggest yield problem was the wax wouldn't adhere, and it would get washed off in the liquid edge bath. Today, we're looking at $150 million for an EUV tool. So, so uh, uh, and people are willing to spend that. So it tells you that, that there is something there. But there are other ways to approach this, because one of the problems you get into this is, is how big a market do you have to address to, to deal with this? So, you know, when you talk about beyond an art, and, and I'm saying less is more, because I don't want to talk about more than more, because people, a lot of there's not a real, I've tried to define more than more, but a lot, there's a lot of flaky de definitions around more than more. And I don't think that, I don't believe new transistors are more than more because Moore didn't talk about transistors. He just talked about components. But if you go back to the transistor and you're saying, I don't have, need to use all those transistors in a device, which is really what's happened with the ARM processors and all the mobile devices, is you're actually divining, d designing a much more contained system with, with, with a lot fewer transistors. I can do well, and, and, and with some of the new stuff that's coming out, whether, you know, I can do SOI wafers, I can do, you know, go to mirrors, or Sue Volta, who's going to talk later. Um, these are all really great technologies to bring new life to old fabs and get, get more power. So, um, basically, there, there's a lot that you can do in this space, and, and in fact, what, what, if I can stay in an old fab, and if I can lower my design cost, I'm actually a lot more, because the the newer technologies actually cost a lot more to design in than the, than the older technology. You always see these charts that show design costs are going out astronomically. And it turns out that, that what they use is the first design off, off the fab. And uh, as you, every fab, the cost of designing goes down. So if you can wait a generation or two to design, you can, get, get, you can design at a much lower cost than you can if you're trying to design at, say, 22 nanometers today. So anyway, thank you. Uh, any questions? Questions? So does that mean if we're successful and uh, we reduce uh, the power dissipation by many orders of magnitude, you're worried whether we're going to have a market? No. I think we're going to have a market. I mean, you show the, the chart on transistor says, if you can continue to keep the cost per transistor going down, and we get we continue to get more performance efficiency out of the systems, we're going to buy it. And it doesn't matter whether it's a laptop, a mainframe, or a cell phone; people are going to buy it. And uh, in fact, it was really interesting because my dad was a device physicist, and, and he actually worked on tunnel devices at RCA Research Labs in 1958-59, um, which tells you there's a lot of history there. But the the, he told me when I first got in, in, in the industry is, is take it on a matter of faith that people are always going to use more transistors. And, and I can remember when the 386 had come out and this reporter from Electronic Business, which is now gone and he's long out of a job, he says, well, who's ever going to use, a, you know, they'll never put a 386 in a microwave oven. Well, I tell you today that 386 level computing is in the, the, the uh, shoes that drive the lights on kids' sneakers. 
<laughs> microwave ovens have gone long beyond that. <laughs> and and uh, um, they're definitely in microwave ovens, and they're definitely in, and, and I know that because I know the guy that actually sold testers to the people that were making the chips that went into the shoes. And, and you know the little, the little cards that you open that have the uh, music stuff in them and you throw them away? They have more computing power than existed in the world in, in the 50s. You know, so, so we, we use this, and, and um, in a scientific paper, that I, American paper that I wrote back in uh, the 80s, 90s, I made this point about if you look at the, the path of mankind, it's always about how do we store and retrieve more information. And if we start with Chauvet cave drawings to, to, to Sumerian clay tokens, you know, going forward, it's, we're always going to use more, more information and, and the ability to store it, to retrieve it, to analyze it. That's the history going back for, for 30,000 years. So I, I don't think it's going to change in the next 10. So, yeah. Design, the design uh, complexity uh, gets so big nowadays that right? you have huge teams doing designs. It's no longer that you build a, a chip with five engineers, right? and the DV part uh, takes a major effort. It's much more than integrating all these cores. So where do we go? Um, well, actually, I thought you were going to go a different question, because one of the interesting things about the transistors, if you look at the total transistor count that's shipped every year today, 99.9 percent .9 something is is memory. Logic is just totally dwarfed by memory, and uh, um, uh, and you're right. We've gone to multi-core uh, multi-core processors. We keep doing more and more, and the and the, the biggest limitation potentially is the design cost. And it's become very you know the ASIC business pretty much dried up, and uh, uh, in the way it was known before. And the, uh, you have to have really huge volumes to, uh, to do any kind of a custom design. The, if I'm talking three to five billion dollars, and I, I'm not going to sell that in a, in a market that's 50 million dollars in size and I sell the part for 15 dollars. I need a really large market. Or I need to be someone like Apple, who, which I call, would call a virtual captive, because they, they basically do what IBM did 30, 40 years ago is they design their own chips and whatnot, get the ASIC, and they make the money on the whole system sale. So, so they, can, they can pull it off that way. But it's, uh, um, it, it's, like I said, to some extent, it's, it's a matter of faith. The, the real question is, is what do we do with the design? Do we go to completely general purpose systems where I can get lots of volume, which is where the mobile phone and the, you know, the mobile phone has huge volume. So you can definitely... Uh, uh, get there with that. So, the, uh, um, uh, the but there's no real answer to what you're saying. You, you, you know, if you're in business, you got to figure out how to design with the constraints you have, what your end market is, and, and everyone is different. Every every system is different. And so, if I'm Intel, I've got a a forty billion dollar market that I can design to. If I'm Samsung, I got this. You know, I can sell all the memory I can make. Uh, if I'm a small SOC company, I have to figure out how to design within those constraints. And that's why I pointed to the Savolta or like the Mirrors technology. If you start to look at some of the new technologies that are coming out where people deal with <laughs> things like, you know, really improving transistor variability at, say, 60 nanometers, that sort of thing, I can get a lot more out of these technologies if I'm, uh, and, and I can do it with a lot less design cost because my, uh, my mass shop has written off all the cost of the pattern writer. They want the business. There's competition among the mass shops, as opposed to if I'm 20 nanometer, I've got to have my own mass shop to pull that off. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that, that have advantages in, in that space that you can back off. And you don't need you know, billions of transistors, as, as, as you know, because there's just a lot of chips that don't use that. I think I'm almost out of time. but. Well, we've got, we've got a yeah, I, I wonder if I could ask uh, a question. Um, in, the, uh, uh, in your market research, uh, uh, let's say we accept that uh, the um, power consumption is, and efficiency is going to be very important. 
uh, is the portable stuff, uh, the cell phones, uh, is that going to be more important as a market driver, or will it be uh, uh, fixed data centers, uh, very large, massive data centers? It's like two different worlds. Which one uh, is going to uh, drive us toward lower power? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I got to pull this out and play with it here. Um, this is, you know, I mean, we want this, right? And uh, uh, we want, you know, what do I do with my cell phone? But we want the cell phone, too. You know, we want these things, right? And they have limited memory. And I, now what I want to do is I want to put my movie on here and then have it on a plane so when I go or whatnot, or do streaming. And those, all that stuff is, is in the cloud, right? So the servers are becoming more and more laden with, with information that's on the cloud that people are accessing to get to these devices. And, and even when you have a laptop and you have, say, uh, um, you know, you have a terabyte of information, you can suck that up with, with videos pretty quickly. And, uh, uh, and, and this, you know, it's your, your, this is a 64 uh, gigabyte device. It was like a thousand bucks, and and by the time I got it out the door, and the um, uh, it, it uses its, you know, the video I have on it. I'm always having to pair stuff uh, because between video and music. So, and if you look at the data traffic on the internet today, the bulk of it, by far, the majority is video traffic going down the internet. It's not data. Data is very, very light. And uh, so, so the answer to your question is, is the cloud is really an integral part of the whole mobile system. You know, and it's, it's, you know, you're using the storage on the cloud to make it more efficient, and then you're using the fact that we've got these huge pipes that can pipe it down. And uh, to, to systems where I have lots of memory now, where I sit there and I ask the question, from my perspective, is that uh, you know, right now what we've got is Netflix went out and says, okay, it's too expensive to mail a, a, a Bluetooth disc to people, so I'm going to put that on a streaming video because I don't have to pay for the streaming. I can just, you know, it's a lot cheaper for me to buy this bandwidth. And then immediately the carriers like Comcast started screaming and said, wait a minute, we, we sell movies for 10 bucks, and, and we're, you're taking our bandwidth and you're getting it for free. And, you know, and so you, you, you get these, that's where the real battleground is coming, and you see it right now in the Communications Act between all the companies that are trying to, to tilt the system in their favor over all of those pipes because it's not this and it's not the servers. What, what you guys are doing here, making better transistors, is going to benefit everything because the, the designer can play with lower power or more performance, they can play that game. There's, there's all these variables, and if, they, and if you give them a better transistor every node, they're going to be happy. And, uh, uh, and that's the way the world works. The, the bigger issue is what happens with the pipe and where does we wind up storing. Do we wind up storing locally or do we wind up storing in the cloud? Because historically, you didn't trust the cloud. You always wanted to have, a, uh, have everything on your, on your system because... You couldn't always find a reliable internet connection, and now it's getting to be really pretty easy. So I think that's the, the uh, that's why I say yes. They're they're both integral. They're they're part of an entire system that's being built. Well, let me follow up on that uh, because I'm not sure uh, that as as we uh, you want me for the video, I guess. Um, so uh, the one of the things that we heard in some of the talks this morning, but particularly from I don't know if he's still here, was uh, Wilfred Hench's talk. Some of these uh, new transistor technologies are really only going to be good for ultra low power but, but modest performance. And you don't really have the same kind of design trade offs with some of these more exotic devices. Now, it seemed like the message that you were telling us was well, Kumi's law forever. And that gets powered by Moore's law and Denard scaling. But Denard, Moore's law and Denard scaling, of course, what everybody in the industry, not everybody, but a lot of people in the industry are quite uh, worried about is that maybe that trend cannot be continued. And so then we have to resort to some of these, these other device concepts which might not give us quite the same kind of design trade-offs that you're talking about. So it's an, I think it is a valid question to say, well, what's the market for that lower power but limited performance technology? Um, is that worth you know, all the effort? Because most of the effort on these novel transistors or magnetic switches or, or what have you, 
uh, and it was very clear on some of Wilfred's charts, right, that the TFET just didn't get there for the ultra high performance. So um, doesn't that present a, a really kind of a change in, in how the market's going to develop? But we're not switching a lot of the transistors any faster anymore anyway because of all the power constraints. You know, we're, the, the systems are running at, at uh, you know, two to four gigahertz. And, and remember all the charts that used to show the hertz just continuing to rise. Right. And so well, we're, we're kind of stuck there today with the existing transistors. So, um, and, and what's happened since about, I'd say once we crossed the, 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 from the microchip to the nanochip era, what you saw was is the focus became on power because you could no longer, you couldn't integrate more transistors to get those performance gains into a single chip without melting the silicon. Right. And that was the problem of Y2K that you saw in the chart, the Intel chart that showed, hey, we're going to be a nuclear power plant and power consumption. So. So power has become really important. Now, if you get to, uh, and, and remember, the performance comes from two sources. One is, is, is or actually really three is, one is, is I have a faster switching transistor, which is kind of gone. Right. And, and then I have more transistors, which allow me to take the architecture and, do, uh, and, 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 and play with that, right? So uh, I can get multi-core, I can do all kinds of things. And, the, 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 you know, and, and you do run into the, the, the interesting question of, of, okay, what do I do with all these transistors because if all I'm doing is video streaming, do I need a lot of computational power to do that? You don't, but you need a lot of memory. And so you're, you're back into the same sort of where you need massive amounts of bits for memory and, and a lot of these switches that we're talking about going forward are the, are, are, do bring those kind of benefits. Um, but the interesting thing is you guys are going to decide in this room, right, because you're the ones that come up with the transistors. And then the markets evolve around that. You know, it, it was just like how, it was just amazing how rapidly you saw the world shift from a more megahertz is better to, uh, um, to a uh, multi-core type world. And people continued to buy PCs. They didn't stop buying PCs. The other one that you've seen here recently is the megapixel racing cameras, right? Um, and, and the problem with cameras is I have a lens. The lens is going to weigh so much. I've got the laws of optics pounding me down there, and then I have a sensor on this end. If I put more pixels in there, I, I get what they call dark current, which is just leakage, into the back of my, into the back of my cell. And then the, uh, uh, so now I get too much noise in my signal. So, so all of a sudden they stop saying, whoa, wait, we, we don't want more megapixels. And so you saw what Apple did in the new iPhone 4S was, was something that the SLR cameras had been doing. In, in fact, Canon was the first one that started selling this back about 10 years ago, was having larger, larger cells so that you got more photons into the cell so that you built more electrons up other than, than what, was, what was leaking into the back of it so you got less noise. So you get a better image. And, and Apple just did this on cell phones. So you do see that as you run into these fundamental physics limits and stuff, and, and or you know what the, what, what the scientists and engineers do in this industry, sort of when they have to move one way or the other, the market adapts pretty quickly to it. So, so, uh, and the only thing I really worry about is if suppose we came to a complete grinding halt and there was no improvement, how long would you keep your phone if if there was no reason to buy a new phone? You know, you'd keep it a lot longer, uh, and you would be wanting a, a cheaper contract uh, from, your, from your cell phone provider, and, and, and the whole thing would come to a real gripe. PC sales would drop off and, and all of that sort of thing. So, so the, 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 if you look at other industries, like if we talk about the auto industry or whatnot, the, uh, they're all driven by replacement. And, uh, and in fact, when you look at those industries, they went through these huge, steep growth curves where everybody that, until you hit the point where everybody that would buy one had bought one, and then it crashes in the Great Depression, and then, and then it takes a while before you get into a replacement cycle. And uh, we've never done that in semiconductors because we keep giving them stuff that's new that they can buy that's different. And because it's solid state, it lasts for a long, long time. I mean, you just go into your, into your uh back closet somewhere. I'm sure you find a lot of old calculators and whatnot that still work quite fine. 
Well, so I guess the hope that uh, a lot of the people here have is that uh, in that in that end game that you're talking about, what we can may not be able to sell more performance, but we could sell it to you for. So maybe by that time, the the carriers will realize that if they want to continue to uh, get more get get their provide something that their customers will value as well. Now maybe that three or four day battery life, maybe I will replace my uh, cell phone if you can give me one that I won't have to charge up every day. Uh, or uh, my PC or my data center start you know, using less power. So we, we might be able to sell the same performance if we can reduce the power. That, I think that's the dream powering a lot of the, of the thinking behind the, the uh, energy efficient electronics for you know, 10 years and 15 years out. Yeah, but you're assuming they're going to do what the consumer wants, and they're going to do what their shareholders want, which is uh, <laughs> where the profits are. And, uh, you know, there, there's another school over here, the MBA school, and they teach them not to do what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good point to stop. Um, and uh, thank Dan again for a very stimulating talk.